Yeah, off to our uh, 3 o'clock. Get some strokes out there. Can you tell us what it is? Right now, I don't know what it is right now. It was 10.25 p.m. and the plane was cruising at 39,000 feet. The crew kept their eyes on a large object with flashing lights visible below them. When they turned west, the object turned too. Here is the actual conversation between the flight's first officer and air traffic control. 564, did you pay that object at all on your radar? Uh, Cactus 564, no I don't. And, uh, talking to the three or four guys around here, no one knows what that is. We've never heard about that. But nobody's painting it at all? Okay, Cactus 564, say again. Uh, there's nothing on the radars on the other uh, centers at all on that uh, particular area, that object that's up in the air? Uh, it's up in the air? A permanent. No, uh, no one knows anything about it. Eventually, the object moved in front of an active thundercloud. When lightning flashed, the crew got a better look. What's the altitude about? I don't know, probably right around 30,000 or so, and it's uh, a drill that starts from going uh, counterclockwise, and uh, the length is unbelievable. The airline crew was seeing something that ground radar was not picking up. Air traffic controllers alerted Cannon Air Force Base in eastern New Mexico to check if military aircraft, or perhaps weather balloons, were known to be in the area. Cannon 21. Cannon, go ahead. Hey, do you guys know if there was anything like a tethered balloon or anything released that should be above tie band? Uh, no, we haven't heard nothing about it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Guy at 39,000 says you see something at 30,000 that the, the length is unbelievable and it has a strobe on it. Uh-huh. This is not good. <laughs> okay. uh, wait, what does that mean? I don't know. It's a UFO. So it's that Roswell crap again. The desert just outside Roswell, New Mexico, was the site of a mysterious aircraft crash in July of 1947. Some 50 years later, the name Roswell had become synonymous with UFOs. And like Roswell, the experience of Flight 564's crew is still unexplained. Though crew members stick to their story, they prefer to remain anonymous. There's a lot of confusion, a lot of hesitancy about even reporting something like this, even in FAA, even in military. They're going to think we're crazy. I don't want to be grounded. I'm risking something here. And uh, a lot of airline pilots feel that way, too. Why should I report this? I don't want to be under a medical microscope here. I'm not losing my mind. Airlines don't like to employ people who see strange things. If you are, have a reputation in your company or your Air Force squadron as being the guy who saw the the UFO from your F-18, uh, I'm not sure I want to fly wing with him, you see. It's a subtle thing. Um, again, it goes back to denial. It's easier to, to deny it and to say, all right, he's an oddball. Well, she just saw something that just couldn't be seen, so she's probably not as reliable as she should be. The fear of ridicule or retribution has kept many UFO eyewitnesses silent. Still, some do step forward, at times with extraordinary revelations. Shag Harbor is a small fishing village on the east coast of Canada. It is a peaceful place where the locals focus on the sea, not the sky. But in 1967, a dramatic UFO incident upended Shag Harbor's quiet ways. It was October 4, 1967, when two of the townspeople en route to their homes spotted something strange above the tree line. My friend and I were talking as I was driving, and all of a sudden my friend said, look, look at those lights in the sky. When we first see them, they looked like they were stopped. Of course, we were driving in the car and we couldn't tell if they were stopped or, or if they were moving or what they were. And after we lost sight of it and we were in around the corner, we gained sight of it for a few more seconds, then we lost sight of it again. I know I was scared when I first got out of the car because I wasn't very long, very long getting into the house like to, to get my father and, and get him to come out and have a look at it. And 
I was kind of hoping that it would stay there long enough for him to see it, and it did. And I come home, and I told my mother about it, and first question, of course, was you drinking? And I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Smith and Kendrick weren't the only ones to see the strange lights. Many of the locals watched as they flickered off and on. Suddenly, the luminous object turned on its side and plummeted into the harbor waters. Eyewitnesses rushed to notify the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, or RCMP. The people who initially arrived on the scene, the civilians who were called in the aid of the RCMP, uh, concerns were for survivors. Most people saw this thing occur from a distance, and it was initially thought that perhaps it was an airplane crash. But what the eyewitnesses saw, or in this case what RCMP officers saw when they arrived on the scene, I mean, there were at least three officers on the shoreline that at least saw a pale yellow light moving on the water. They all felt that it was something quite unusual. The RCMP officers were not alone in observing the mysterious object. They were surrounded by a small gathering of spectators. And we all seen it, the police seen it. And everybody was, I guess, startled by it. Nobody had, none of the people that were there had ever seen anything like it before. You know, I, had, no, I know I hadn't. The witnesses stood and stared, mesmerized by the strange light on the water. Then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the light vanished. A Coast Guard cutter was summoned, but local fishermen, already on board their vessels, headed for the spot where the light had last been seen. They were looking for survivors, but the only clue that anything had happened that night was a thick layer of an unknown substance. There was a great bubbly foam, and it was yellow, nothing I had ever seen before. You couldn't smell no odor or anything. And we went about probably three lengths of the boat, and we ran out of it. And we turned around, turned the boat around, and came back into it, and we ran out of it again. The foam, like the lights, eventually disappeared. When it was obvious there was no further sign of distress, the search ended for the evening. By the following morning, the RCMP had already made contact with nearby military bases. They were hoping to find a reasonable explanation for what they'd seen. There was none. This left the small town of Shag Harbor to become big news. It's a headline story throughout the North American press and beyond. And uh, in that, it was said quite clearly there were statements made by uh, personnel at Canadian Forces Headquarters in Ottawa saying that, yes, indeed, we are searching for the crash of what we believe to be an unidentified flying object. This is one of those rare cases where something indeed real has gone into the water, and it's not an aircraft, and it's not space junk. This was a, an official statement. Canadian Armed Forces clearly stated that the object was officially a UFO. But the question of where it went after hitting the water was still a mystery. Canada's Department of National Defense was determined to find out. Military authorities ordered an underwater search. Within hours of the sighting, a Navy diving team was bobbing off the shores of the tiny fishing village, scanning the harbor bottom for debris. Meanwhile, Shag Harbor residents were stunned by what was happening in their small town. Those who had been the first to witness the lights were quickly gaining notoriety. Everybody teased me a lot about 